Hi, this is Travis from The Stephanie Miller Show. Please enjoy this clip on the Political Voices Network. Talk to us about this this fictional gay website case, which <laughs> none of us seem to understand. I know Rachel Bittacoffer, I think, tweeted you and said, Bar McQuaid, how? How does this get all the way to the Supreme Court when they don't have standing? Right? I mean, this is fictional. How did this happen? Can you explain? Yeah, so this is the uh, 303 Creative versus Elena's case you're talking yep. about, yeah. the, uh, yeah. the, the, the website. You know, this one strikes me, actually, although I think, again, this is policy masquerading as law when they are discriminating against people. There's a there's a, a Colorado law that says that LGBT com community is protected from discrimination in places of public accommodation. Businesses cannot discriminate on that basis. That strikes me as a compelling governmental reason that's narrowly tailored that require anyone who opens their doors to do business, to do business with minorities, religious groups, and members of the LGBTQ community. I am less troubled on the standing issue, I think, than other people are, because I think this is what is sometimes referred to as a pre-enforcement action. Because it is state action, a person could have the chilling effect. Um, I don't want to run afoul of the law, so I'm going to file a lawsuit to get an opinion uh, before I actually suffer injury. When it's the state that is enforcing a law that's actually permissible. In fact, it was the absence of that state enforcement that I think really rankled me and others when Texas pre-Dobbs passed that law about the Texas heartbeat law yeah. uh, that made it illegal to perform abortion services after six weeks or so of, um, of from conception. And the, the, the workaround they did there was instead of making it enforceable by the state, which would permit pre-enforcement action and uh, perhaps get it struck down, they made it only um, allowable by private action so an individual yeah. could sue someone on that basis so when you have the state as we do in this Elenis case uh as the enforcer out there the worry is it could have a chilling effect even before uh you you are injured so yeah. i have less of a problem with that but i still have a problem on the merits of this decision yeah. which really says um i can close my doors even though i've opened to others based on my religious view that your marriage is, quote, false. Well, you had a great tweet. I have a religious objection to bigots. Can I deny yeah. now deny them <laughs> yeah. services, too? I mean, and by the way, you made a great point about voting as well. You said uh, if there's a silver lining, the student loan ruling, and also this one, you know, uh, it, it's likely to have the effect of getting out the student vote. I mean, this quote about that, Congress uh, could pass a law that does exactly what Biden's executive order pretended to do if their bill really is that popular. Either they can pressure enough Republicans to flip or they can defeat enough Republicans for opposing it and take back Congress immediately passed their bill in January 2025. I mean, the only good news that happened is God bless voting rights and Neil Katyal, right? I mean, it just seems like that's the only way we're going to be able to address a lot of this is by voting, right? I mean, the president said, I mean, the president can't expand the Supreme Court, but Congress can, right? Yeah, and I, and I think the one good news from last week from the Supreme Court was that Moore versus Harper case where the majority rejected that independent state legislature theory, which was a very terrifying possibility that a state legislature could simply overrule the votes of a state and impose their own slate. You know, this was part of the uh, Jeffrey Clark, uh, Donald Trump plot to steal the election. It would make that permissible. So at least that got beaten back. You know, there's still partisan gerrymandering out there that is skewing election results. There's still voter suppression laws that are making it difficult for young people and minorities to vote. Uh, but um, as you just said, I, I think one of the things we saw post Dobbs here in my home state of Michigan was voters were highly motivated on the question of abortion after Dobbs. Yeah. Uh, Michigan passed a constitutional amendment to permit abortion. Um, and for the first time in 40 years, Democrats took the House and the Senate in the yes. state. We could see a similar, you know, young, nothing will mobilize young people like taking away their student loan forgiveness. Yes. So it could oh. be the same backlash nationally, I think. Let's get to the fun stuff about Donald Trump going to prison before we go. <laughs> I saved the best for last. It's like dessert. Um, you, <laughs> a, mo a bunch of tantalizing tweets of yours. You said uh, reports indicate Jack Smith is focusing on Trump's lawyers in the J6 probe. Um, you said in the Mar-a-Lago indictment, Trump's best defense is likely delay. Watch for the tell, what we call oceans of motions. Um, you said if Jack Smith has not already interviewed for, former Arizona Governor Ducey, you can bet he's typing up the subpoena now. More evidence of conspiracy to defraud the United States. It it sure feels like we're going to warp speed on both of these cases. Where, where do, where's your take on where we are now in documents and J6? 
Yeah, in some ways, it was an unfortunate distraction for Jack Smith to have to work on this Mar-a-Lago case. I mean, an important case, yeah. but something he needed to work through. But it seems that now that that case is under indictment, he is really um, accelerating the investigation. And, you know, we only know what's publicly reported. There is likely lots of other stuff occurring below the surface. Um, but the fact that they've had Meadows into the grand jury, they've had Mike Pence into the grand jury, and now they seem to be looking at the fake electors and some of the lawyers, um, you never know how much is next. You know, even in my own cases, people would ask me, when are you going to indict this case? I said, I don't know. I get it. I, you know, every time you talk to a witness, there might be one more. You know, they might tell you about five more witnesses that you have to talk to. Yeah. But um, it does seem like they have uh, very solid evidence to prove um, a theory of conspiracy to defraud the United States. That is interfering with a function of government, the lawful uh, transition of presidential power by means of fraud, lying to the public about a stolen election. And so it, it strikes yeah. me as a good theory there of when they're, I don't know when they'll be yeah. done gathering all the evidence. Yeah. Um, last one, real quick. You said as former U.S. attorney Rudy Giuliani knows federal cases are ma how they're made. His proffer is the first step toward exploring cooperation and a plea agreement. There is no honor among thieves. What can you explain? What is a proffer? What is yeah. happening with him? So a proffer is kind of the first step toward exploring a cooperation and plea agreement. Lawyers, uh, prosecutors don't want to, um, uh, promise leniency or uh, declining charges uh, in a vacuum. They want to know what the person can deliver. So it's sort of like taking a car for a test drive. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what you say before I promise you anything. So come in. I promise I won't use anything you say against you in this one meeting and tell me everything you know and everything you're able to tell me uh, that would be of value to me as a prosecutor in prosecuting other people. Mo he met with them for eight hours. Most often when someone comes in and has that conversation, uh, you know, especially someone in Rudy Giuliani's position, prosecutors hear some things that sound valuable and they say, all right, uh, we will agree to a cooperation deal. You must plead guilty, but we will uh, seek leniency with the judge up to and including probation, depending on what you are allowed able to deliver. So it sounds like they're working down that path. And I think Rudy knows where the bodies are buried. Mm, there it is, my first drink of the day, Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic. Many of you know my, my story. I stopped drinking wine for three years during COVID, during the lockdown as part of a health reset. Now I drink wine in moderation, but this is an amazing new product. I've always believed in probiotics. And Z-Biotics, check this out. You drink just one of these. It's the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. I I am using this and I feel great in the morning. I don't have to worry if I have an extra glass of wine, I still feel great in the morning. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. I've always had acid reflux problems. It is this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. All I know is it works. It is Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic. Go to zbiotics.com slash political voices or scan the QR code on the screen right now.